Sell in May and go away is a quite a well-known adage. It basically means sell up your stocks and shares, go away for the summer and come back. I think it's actually the end of October, as the saying goes. So go away for basically six months because the markets will not perform so well in that period and you're better off to just sit on the sidelines or sit in cash. Harriet, I want to understand if there's any truth in this statement. Harriet's a portfolio manager on the multi-asset side. And we've been talking a bit about this. I want to start off with the numbers. What does history suggest? Is it true? So surprisingly, it actually does hold. Um, so we've looked at numbers a couple of different ways. So if you look at the S&P returns, um, they've generally delivered between 2%, around 2% between May and October, and then close to 7% uh, from November to April. So you know, quite, quite a stark difference. And that's with data going back to the 1970s. <coughs> Uh, and then the other way you can look at it is look at average monthly returns across a, a broader range of, of equity markets. Uh, and we looked at data going back to 2000, um, which suggests, again, that, that it does hold true uh, and um, even more so across uh, European equities. Yeah, I know, because you, you've been sending me all sorts of spreadsheets and charts and numbers and, and all of them do point to the fact that there is some truth in this. And as you say, it's not just US markets. It's not even just European markets. It's across a lot of markets, a lot of regions. Um, what other patterns came out? I was particularly intrigued by one of the tables you sent me on broken down by month. Um, any comments on that? Yeah, so, I mean, what was surprising, I thought there, um, we looked at the data across um, different time periods uh, and obviously different regions. And September generally is just really poor month um, on average for for, for equity markets, uh, uh, which, you know, again, surprised me. And um, in, you know, on average, again, January tends to be a relatively good month. OK, so again, that's playing into the point of sell in May and go away. So September... Uh, not being so good, so the period you should be away, and January when you come back being good. So it sounds like this kind of theory is stacking up. So if that is true, and it's the case that this, this theory is sensible, you know, do you and the rest of the portfolio management team kind of pack up your bags in May, head off, and come back in late October, you know, stroke November? Um, is, that, is that the best strategy? Is that what we should be doing? It would be lovely. Um... <laughs> to take that much time of the year off uh, as you know not impact returns unfortunately uh, at the end of the day when you're looking at statistics um you know th there's there's always a but and the big but here is that an average number obviously high a wide dispersion in actual returns um across all the different years and there's going to be years where it doesn't hold true where you get very good returns over those months uh, and july even within you know the the months that we've looked at tends to be an um, average a positive month uh, for returns and obviously last year we saw a nine percent return um in in july so you know <laughs> it would be great uh, to be able to, to, to go away but unfortunately we have to stay at the desk and can you continue to watch markets because uh, there can definitely be some very good opportunities over the summer months OK, OK, very clear. So within that within that period, there's definitely some periods that can do well. And as you say, even the ones that historically don't do well, it's an average and there can be years where that that's totally different. OK, to finish up, what I think people will be most interested in is what do we think for this year? Will the theory hold true? Yeah, I mean, this year it's, um, you know, the outlook is very opaque uh, from an economic perspective uh, and there's a lot of uh, factors which can, can swing markets either way. Obviously, we have a couple of known unknowns. So we have the debt ceiling uh, coming up in June, which will be at the forefront of investors' minds. And of course, if that doesn't pan out well and, and there's kind of no resolution to the debt ceiling, then uh, that will definitely you know, impact markets <coughs> and can make uh, the old adage feel like it's you know, ringing true again this year. Um, but on the other hand, we've seen you know, growth and earning surprises um, being more positive at the start of this year. And if inflation pressures ease and political risks decline, then you know, that can provide some positive breathing space for the market. And then as we look um, towards the end of 2023, uh, we expect growth to, to slow more and for that to start to become more visible in the data. And as that is starting to come through, then that can make the outlook for, for markets towards the end of the year more challenging. OK, interesting. So you're saying it could almost be the inverse of the theory. So at the moment, you know, there's some reason to be positive and obviously so, some short term concerns with debt ceiling and that. But we can see some positivity coming through in earnings and growth. But actually, towards the end of the year, you think that those growth concerns could come true 
fruition and that could be challenging. Okay, look, it's always impossible to predict what markets are going to do over the next few months. So, so let, let's wait and see. But it is interesting that you're still saying there could be opportunities in the summer months, which I, which I take as a positive. Okay, Harriet, that's been really clear. Uh, we will be back next week with our usual update because it's the end of the month. So it will be the end of May. Uh, we'll be doing an update looking back. So we might be able to, to give a bit of insight into how well or not the theory is working this year. Um, until then, take care and we'll see you next week.